Hello, everybody. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to interview Dr. Justin Lauk from the Birmingham Center for uh, Cellular Therapy and Transplantation, Center for Clinical Hematology, uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, UK. And we will talk about his um, uh, recent paper published on Cancer Journal entitled Additional Cytogenetic Features Determine Outcome in Patients Allograft for TP53 Mutant Acute Myeloid Leukemia. Welcome, uh, Justin, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thanks, Camelo. That's uh, great to uh, speak to you today. And um, so I think like better to start with a little bit of uh, background, right? So can you give us a little overview of the medical problem that you research focused on? Why TP53 mutations are important in AML and why particularly, for instance, in patients undergoing uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant? Yeah, so I think this was... Um like many um, clinical questions born out of um, discussions in clinic really with our colleagues. And um, as many of you are well aware, TP53 mutant cancers in general are difficult to treat. And this is um, certainly the case in acute myeloid leukemia where it's actually found in 10% of um, patients with acute myeloid leukemia and as you might imagine, um, it's enriched in the population who go on to have a allograft. Um, and certainly um, in the UK and I'm sure around the world, there's increasing controversy as to whether or not patients with TP53 mutant AML uh, benefits from an allograft, even though um, we all know that with chemotherapy alone, it's unlikely to cure this form of leukemia. But I think it, you know, arising from the data in myelodysplastic syndrome and uh, um, poor outcomes of torture patients with TP3 mutant and BS, um, there's been um, a move perhaps in, uh, in, in, amongst clinicians to question whether or not you know, patients are indeed benefiting from uh, TP53 mutant AML and from, from an allograft. Um, and in part, I think this is, you know, an issue that's going to be an ongoing question across many subtypes of AML, across many genetic subtypes, shall we say, where there are um, a need for large registry, large cooperative studies to try and understand um, the you know, outlooks of, for patients for, in, in uh, ultimately very uh, small subgroup of a rare uh, disease. So that's why we um, undertook this study with the EBMT group. Nice. Uh, and can you guide us through the study design? Sure. So this is a um, retrospective uh, study design. Um, in the era of um, AML treatments, which we're all familiar with, but we're slowly moving away from, but nonetheless, uh, it's relatively recent from 2015 to 2019. And to try and have a homogeneous population, uh, we picked on the patients who enter an allograph in their first CR um, and who are either intermediate or adverse risk cytogenetics. So, um... Let's start with the characteristic of your cohort. Uh, how many patients, uh, median age, which type, which type of transplant did you collect? Um, can you give us some overview yeah, of that? Yeah. So um, in terms of the numbers, this is probably one of the largest cohorts of AML patients uh, with TP3 mutant AML. There's 179 patients with TP3 mutant AML. And we compared to 601 patients transplanted on the same time period without this mutation. The median age is probably slightly younger than what we're probably encountering click nowadays. The median age is 58 in the cohorts. And um, what we found in the you know baseline comparisons between the two um, groups, um, the main differences were really in terms of the striking different cytogenetic abnormalities, which you you know might expect, but but uh, certainly an enrichment of uh, high-risk monosomal carotypes and complex carotypes 
and they were characterized as 17 p abnormalities, uh, which is not unsurprising um, as we know that T3 resides on, on that chromosome. So um, I think this is in some ways very representative of, of what we will see in the clinic. And which type of uh, transplant platform uh, did this patient undergo? Yeah, so we didn't we didn't specify. So there were both um, uh, RICs and uh, and and, and malablative transplants, uh, as well as uh, some patients who had um, in vivo T cell depletion and and not. So it's quite a broad platform, um, but we really wanted to sort of increase the numbers of patients with T P three mutations to try and um, analyze that subgroup in more detail. I see. And what did you first notice um, when the, when you analyze uh, the outcomes of this patient? Uh, were the TP53 mutant different from like the wild type? Uh, and if yes, why? In which uh, uh, fashion? Essentially, you know, in terms of differences between the TP3 mutants and non-mutant group, the, um, the striking increase in relapse rates reducing overall survival. And um, this is actually a uh, I guess the more interesting point was that um, given that there was a significant association with these adverse cytogenetic features and the adverse uh, prognostic uh, feature of TP3 mutation still remains significant on the multivariate analysis, even when you account for these other you know, very high risk uh, features that we are aware of, such as monosomal carotides and complex carotides. Okay, so um, did you observe any um, particular characteristics in cases uh, showing, uh, for instance, the higher rate of uh, cumulative incidence of relapse? Because of course, like we are talking about uh, 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 high risk patient, uh, we know also from uh, the latest ELN uh, of 2022, uh, these are uh, characterized uh, as uh, adverse risk, but uh, in uh, across all these patients, perhaps uh, some features uh, were like popping out uh, in cases with the highest uh, uh, CI and uh, CIR, for instance, or did the type of transplant, uh, source of stem cells, uh, or any other variable associate with the um, highest rate of uh, relapse? Yeah, no, this is a great question. So. Given you know, given that quite distinct properties of these TP3 mutated uh, AML, we have um, we we went further essentially looking at this particular TP3 mutant cohort and looking at factors which affect their over survival, leukemia free survival. Only the presence of uh, abnormalities 17P or complex carotype affect the outcomes of these patients. Um, unfortunately, there's no direct transplant variable that we can um, identify that might influence outcomes such as uh, transplant intensity or presence of T-cell depletion. Um, and really actually the striking thing about this was that, you know, in the absence of these um, uh, uh, abnormal cytogenetic features, you know, the loss of the other TP3 gene or complex carotype, their overall survival of um, patients with uh, TP3 mutations were indeed actually fairly favorable and uh, indeed comparable to the non mutant cohort. So I think this is uh, quite instructive in terms of um, how we think about um, counseling uh, uh, these patients when they come up to transplant clinic. Right, because of course, like uh, the one of these conclusions can be. It's uh, not correct to somehow label patient uh, in a way, right? Uh, there are many labels uh, also um, under the TP53 mutant umbrella, right? Uh, so right. As, you, as you can say, this may change uh, drastically the outcome uh, of a patient with this kind of disease. So um, can you tell us um, the main conclusion of your study? Um, uh, what our trainees need to focus when they assess uh, uh, transplant eligibility criteria and indication for AML with uh, TP53 uh, mutations? Yeah, so I mean, this all you know all boils down to that central discussion we have with patients and 
in, in deciding transplant eligibility in terms of the balance between you know, non, the non-relapsed mortality uh, risk uh, with the relapse risk. So I think, I mean, studies like this are important in terms of how we uh, couch that discussion in terms of relapse risk, um, even with the transplant, shall we say, um, because this may be something that um, you know comes up in the patient discussion that 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 that, that they realize that um, you know their appreciation of the risk involved, shall we say, uh, for example, in the very highest risk cohorts, uh, may be something that uh, they, they they're not willing to undertake. So I mean I th I think this is um uh, this is going to be a, a important issue um uh, and certainly a recurring issue uh, in clinics. So in conclusion, how do you think these findings uh, can uh, inform uh, future transplant strategies and management uh, of uh, TP53 mutant ML? Uh, yeah. So I mean I I guess you know um. Fortunately for us, young trainees and um, people who've just finished the training, the, 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 the world is constantly moving, right? So, I, I mean, it's not clear how this data will hold up in the, in the coming years in, in terms of novel agents, whether or not uh, pre-treatment affects, you know, this and post-transplant outcomes. So that's a very hot topic. And, and I guess, you know, at Birmingham, we've been very interested in post-transplant MRD monitoring. Um, uh, hopefully we'll have something um, out very soon on that aspect. And I guess that's going to be part of the playbook, I think, for, you know, in terms of how we monitor patients post-transplant, especially in this very high-risk cohort still, and when not maintenance studies, uh, which I suspect will be standard of care, or some might argue already standard of care in fit you know, fit for ITD mutant patients, if we have a, a, a good drug, you know, I suspect these will be, um, these patients will be, uh, will benefit greatly from it. And, and I guess the last point to make was, uh, you know, from a scientific standpoint, you know, understanding genetics of TP mutation and then really understanding that in, in many of these very highest patients, even after an hour graph and what we expect to see a sort of GVL effect there's clearly still a very immunosuppressive environment in, in this particular subtype of leukemia um, in the sense that we couldn't you know, really identify a transplant variable that we can manipulate that might influence our patients. So I think um, a, a lot of work still for uh, all of us to do, Camilla. So um, uh, uh, it should be interesting in the years to come. Well, thank you very much, um, Justin. This is like... Um... Uh, a very important topic because, of course, uh, TP53 represent the um, uh, the real important problem uh, across, I would say, all hematological malignancies. So, so uh, especially uh, in uh, the myeloid neoplasia setting, uh, as you say, like sometimes there are also like issues uh, regarding indication of this patient to transplant because you know, oh, but they are going to relapse anyway. So I've heard colleagues saying like, uh, my transplantologist doesn't want to transplant this patient. And so it's important to know that like TP53 alone doesn't mean anything, as you said, but like it's always uh, um, accounting for all the variables of uh, the, the mutations, the genetics uh, 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 that really uh, makes the difference uh, and uh, can inform on transplant eligibility criteria and perhaps in the future also our post-transplant management. Uh, uh, with preemptive uh, strategies or uh, uh, maintenance uh, after transplant, definitely. So, yeah, absolutely, agree. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, I hope uh, our trainees uh, enjoyed and like can grasp the main important message from your paper now. And uh, um, I will see you soon, hopefully, perhaps in person at ASH, since we are like ticking uh, for the annual meeting. And uh, with our trainees, uh, uh, we will see each other next episode. <laughs> Goodbye. Brilliant. Thanks, Camilla. Yeah, everyone. Take care.